Praise God. All right, please, you may be seated. Please, let's have a seat. Uh, by the way, that was a wonderful time of worship. Uh, it touched my heart. Please, let's appreciate all the musicians, the worship leaders. Come on, do it very well. Especially if you are like me, you can't sing. Appreciate them. <laughs> Praise God. Such a pleasure to be here. So I count it a privilege, not a right, to uh, minister at MLF. It's, um, it's a great work that is going on around here. Uh, obviously, you know, and, I mean, when you walk into this place, you know that God is here, all right? And when you get to a place where God is, uh, you give honor uh, to the people that God is using uh, and to God who is the one that called all of us. Uh, so I want to appreciate my friends, uh, Pastor Yemi and Pastor Bimbo. Uh, thank you for the great work that you are doing. Thank you for making an impact in the lives of ministers. Thank you for being a blessing here at, the, at Global Impact Church and being a blessing all over the world globally. We celebrate you, and I want you to know that Bola and I love you very much. We love the openness that we enjoy with you. We love the friendship, yeah, and uh, we love your spirit as well. Let's appreciate them one more time. I'm sure by this time, if you don't have a close friend, you should be jealous. Yeah, and I'm trying to provoke you to good works. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to provoke you to good works. Don't be a lonely leader. Yeah, don't be a lonely leader. That was the last message I preached at Exponential this year. The Elijah syndrome, the lonely leader. Don't be a lonely leader. Yeah. You have to be able to connect up, you know, down and sideways. What I mean is you have mentors, you have peers, and you have prodigies. And you have them so close that you can open your heart to them. Uh, I have a principal mentor and I have you know, other mentors that I can say anything to that I can open my heart to. And I have friends that we can discuss anything. Pastor Emi is number one of them. That we can discuss anything, anything. There's, there's nothing that is too much for discussion. In fact, we need to do something to our chat. We encode it and save it because people cannot read those charts. <laughs> yeah, people should not read those charts. <laughs> All right. And uh, Prince Will, always a blessing. Thank you, Prince, for the great work that you do for God and for humanity. And I came with uh, some of my associates. Uh, Pastor Debo Motunde is here, one of my most senior associates. And uh, uh, my assistants, Shino and Mensa, thank you for all you do. All right. Baby steps. The topic that I was given, that MLF gave me, is baby steps in ministry, managing ministry finance. So I was curious when I saw baby steps. But coming from Pastor Yemi, I'm not surprised because it can manufacture anything. Yeah. So baby steps in managing uh, uh, ministry finance. And I'm going to approach this from possibly a bit of an unusual dimension for me, which is that I love to teach systematically. I love to teach using slides, you know, and all that. Uh, maybe I have a few if I'm, if I'm able to use it fine, if I'm not able to use it. Because I feel the issue of finance is something, when I was, you know, praying about this this morning, I just felt like, let me just talk from my heart. Let me just talk. So I'll just start out first, speaking from my heart. I'll get to a point, if I feel like getting back to some of the points in my slide, I'll go back to it. If not, uh, everything will come in into the talk. Is that okay? Micah. Micah chapter 3. I sent this uh, verse of the scripture to Pastor Yemi like two weeks ago <laughs> by WhatsApp. Micah 3, 11 and 12. I want to read it from New Living Translation. Micah 3, verse 11 and 12 from New Living Translation. It says, you... Rulers make decisions based on bribery. You priests teach God's laws only for a price. You prophets won't prophesy unless you are paid. Yet all of you claim to depend on the Lord. No human I'm sorry, no harm can come to us, you say. For the Lord is here among us because of you. He said, because of you, Mount Zion will be plowed like an open field. 
Jerusalem will be reduced to ruins. A ticket will grow on the heights where the temple now stands. This, when I read this uh, 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 two verses a few weeks ago, especially in New Living Translation, fear gripped my heart. So I copied it, put it, <laughs> and sent it to my friend and said, look, this, this thing is troubling my heart. Because what this means is that the issue of money is a serious matter. We have seen it as a serious matter as a nation. In fact, we voted in our current president based on the promise of fighting corruption. Yeah, that's why most Nigerians voted for him. Uh, the only collateral that, or the only thing that was standing for him was that we said he had integrity. And you know, I remember my pastor, Pastor Sam, was saying one day that, God man, is it not a shame on the church that the whole of Nigeria, won't, are look, they're looking for somebody to vote for? And they said they have found a man of integrity. And that was the basis for us voting, and the man is not even a Christian. I thought if we're looking for a person of integrity that we want to vote for as a nation, we will, we will probably be looking for someone that is connected uh, to, to Christ. So that was where I started thinking that it looks like we may have missed it too. Yeah. It doesn't mean that a non-believer cannot have integrity, but I'm just saying that the number one politician touted for having integrity happened to be a non-believer. Yeah, happened to be a non-believer. And the Bible says there, put that scripture back, it says the rulers of the people, the pastors, the prophets, yeah, says the rulers, they make decisions based on bribes, which is what goes on in government quarters. The priest, they teach laws only for a price. Yeah. The law of God only for a price. And the prophets, he said they won't prophesy except they are paid. <laughs> he said, yet all, all of you claim to be depend, depending on the Lord. Because Nigeria were very religious as a people. We all claim to be depending on God. No harm can come to us, you say. For the Lord is here amongst us. Look at verse 12. This is the, where I became afraid. Because this description shows that when the heart of a people has gone after money from the different cadre of the society, but especially including the church, it means that we're joking with the church. Because the Bible now says here, it said, Manzan shall be plowed. Yeah like an open field. Jerusalem will be reduced to ruins. And he said where they used to have a church before, a thick bush will be there. That's, that's, that, that's what we see there from the prophecy of Micah. If it's only the politicians that are doing all that, I'm not sure the repercussion will come on the church. But the priests and the prophets also join. That's why I believe God is saying is the, it's from the church I will start, I will visit first. Now, this is where I'm going. You know, we talk about Islamization of the country and many other things. We talk about persecution against the church. And Jesus said, I will build my church and the gate of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, before we talk about all the things that we, we've always been talking about and saying uh, there's an agenda against the church and, and all that, there's a bigger agenda that the church itself has against herself. And that is what happens when we don't deal with the issue of money properly. When the church, ministers, pastors, leaders in the body of Christ we become more money-driven than vision-driven. We become more money-driven than kingdom-driven. It means that there's something that we already put in place to open the door for the enemy to attack the church. And this time around, I don't even think it's the enemy, it's God himself. You know, one of the things that is difficult to believe is that it's possible to be praying against Satan. Meanwhile, it's God that is 
allowing everything that is happening. <laughs> Let me tell you a short story. This is how I learned it. Many years ago, maybe about 20 years ago or more, uh, over 20 years ago now, my pastor was being denied visa. Yeah, this was like 1999, there about, yes. Was being denied visa, you know, consistently. In fact, not even, maybe 97 or 98. Was being denied visa, and he said, one day, the, the straw that broke the camel's back, this time around, he said, guys, pray along with me. In fact, I didn't have to say it. We were already praying along. <laughs> yeah. In the church office that day, as we were going to the embassy, we were fasting. See, this visa thing in the olden days used to be a serious matter. Yeah. We were fasting. He himself had prayed, had organized his document, and he said when he was leaving home that day, he told God, if they reject me visa today, it's not the devil, it's you. Yeah. Because everything that needs to be done has been done. And I will take it as you. <laughs> so, he went to the embassy. I'm just making a point quickly and I'll get back to, to my text. That it's possible sometimes that what we are praying against, and we are praying against the devil, but it's God that is in charge of what is happening. And there, there, there's nothing you can do against God that will align with him. Are you following me today? My pastor got to the embassy, was a UK embassy, and they denied him visa. And he said as he packed his stuff and was working out, he said, but God, you know, I told you that if this happens, it is you. Yeah. And he said he got into his car, was driving back to the mainland. And God was telling him, yes, you are right. It is me, my son. <laughs> it is me. You know, it's good for, <laughs> for one to be, uh, uh, for, for you to come to terms with certain things. And he said he went straight home, entered into his study and sat down. I said, God, now that I know it is you, what do you want from me? What do you want from me? And he sat down, and God said, there's only one thing. I know if you start to travel now, with the way your heart is, all you are thinking is dollar and pounds. So the moment I open this floodgate, and you know people are waiting for you, they may say, you should come and preach. The way this church is, that's how you are going to abandon it and be going all over the world. <laughs> he said, sit down first. Make a commitment to me that when you are invited to preach, one, it's not every ministration you have to take, you have to seek me, and then two, you will go preach and come back. Because what was, what was more prevalent then was that most people would go two months, three months, yeah, they will pack itinerary together. Yeah, you can preach, do all night there, do all day here. Move from this state to that state, especially in the U.S. And, you know, preaching around and giving you $250, $500 here and there. And oh, ticket, uh, ticket money, sorry. Uh, sorry for speaking. <laughs> ticket money has to be complete. And then there has to be, you know, it's like the thing has to, to jive. So he said he wrote it down and signed. And God said, now that you have agreed to my terms, Write the British High Commissioner and uh, petition them. So he said he started, he was just writing in anger, and God said, No, tear that thing. Write it in a very civil manner. Yeah, and make your point and send it to them. Do you know he did that? Send it to them, and he got a response, and it apologized and gave him visa. And from that point, the world became his parish. But there was already a mind shift that has happened. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Let's go to Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Matthew 6 and 24. Jesus was very emphatic here, reading it from New King James Version. He says, no one can serve two masters. For either you will eat the one and love the other, or else you will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. In the New Living Translation, it said, in the last uh, phrase there, it said, you cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. You know, when Jesus wanted to challenge us about 
who we should be loyal to, and who we should serve. What do you expect? What do you think he should have been talking about? Like, uh, is it that you serve God or serve the devil? Right? Say so you are loyal to God or loyal to the devil. But he put money instead of the devil. What is the opposite of God? <laughs> and somebody answer, what is the opposite of God? How come when Jesus was saying that you have to choose who you be loyal to, he did not put the devil there? Because he knows that you won't easily just be loyal to the devil. You, as Christian. I, I, I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. The average pastor cannot say, cannot even accept it. If you say, you are disloyal to God, but you are loyal to the devil, say, eh, me, loyal to the devil. Jesus said, you cannot serve two masters. And you expect that he will say, you cannot serve God and Satan. But he said, you cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and money. It's a matter of mindset, ladies and gentlemen. That's where I'm driving at. When we talk about managing ministry finance as a minister, as a man of God, as a woman of God, the first place we start from is from our heart. It starts from your heart. It starts from my understanding about money. It starts from making up my mind that I will master money. That's where it starts from. We will then lay out our things on it, but that's where it starts from. Wealth is not my vision. Becoming wealthy is not my calling. My calling is different. Becoming wealthy is a state of being. I can be wealthy and not fulfill my calling. I will say it together. Yeah. I can be rich and yet not fulfill my calling. The temptation that we all have as men and women of God is to overfocus on our welfare and our capacity to be okay and to accumulate wealth and think that that actually defines our calling. I will say together. Yeah. The focus on my calling is much more important than the focus on wealth or money. That's what I'm, I, I'm talking about. Wealth is not my vision and it's not my calling. It's an enabler. For my vision. It's an enabler for my vision. And I need to understand it. I must have a conceptual definition of money and wealth as an enabler, not the calling itself. Not the calling itself. So don't put the cat before the horse. Don't focus on the enabler. Focus on the people and focus on your calling. The God who calls has a way of enabling us to fulfill the call that he has given us. Secondly, Money flows, I'm talking about mindsets that we need to imbibe quickly. Money flows in the direction of value. How do I mean? Wherever value is being offered, money will come. So when you hear people like Dr. David Oedipo saying that, uh, don't raise money, raise men. What he was, what he was literally saying in, those, in that phrase is focus on making impact. Focus on, and I know all of us, but I need to underscore it again here. That we need to focus more on making impact, focus more on touching lives than focusing on money. Let me put it in another way. Money is provision. It is not division. Yeah. Can I say that one more time? Money is provision. It is not division. We cannot focus on provision to the detriment of division. And it's a mindset that we all need to have. That's how you'll be able to sleep well. Yeah. You know, some, some pastors, uh, the church is so indebted that when they sleep, they are seeing dollars in their dream. Yeah. And all kinds of narrow signs and different things like that. Yeah. And it's because we think about money a lot. It's good to think about money, but not to think about it to the extent that nothing can enter again. Yeah. You know, you, you can think about money so much that you won't be able to get real revelation again. Because all the space that you have on your mind to process revelation has been occupied by thinking about money. I mean, we're thinking about money. So, it's provision, it's not evasion. Over-focusing on money can corrupt our conscience. Yeah. Over-focusing on money can corrupt our conscience. And we all need to pass the money test. 
In fact, if you're just, if you're just, if you're a young church planter here, I can tell you this for free, that your money test is still coming. If you look through the Bible, everyone pass their money test. Uh, anyone that God will use well will pass their money test. If you're an associate minister here, you have to pass your money test. Yeah, it's because you don't want to be like Gehazi or Judas. And anybody here who is a senior pastor, please understand, I'm telling you from experience, you will have your Judas. Yes. If Jesus cannot escape one, if you have one or two, you are not doing badly. I, I just need to need you to understand it. There are some things that are just that are just part of ministry. There will just be one or two people who will lose money in your ministry to the point that they will be tempted to do certain things. That's what I'm talking about. There's no big ministry in the world today that has not experienced one or two Judases. All you can do is to help your people just like we're helping ourselves here right now, for them to have the right mindset about money. Let me also say this. Too over-provision, as in too much provision, can kill your vision. Yeah. And I'll put it in terms for you. When I was living this star, let me start to be a bit practical. When I was living this star, some people had a mind that you know, my pastor was very benevolent to me and he gave me a lot of money and that was why, you know, we could go to the island and get some things done and all that. What most people did not understand is that Desta happened to be a well-run church based on policies. I sat as a director at director's meeting when we crafted exit policies. When I was exiting, my pastor reminded me in one statement Say, uh, Godman, uh, you remember all those policies that we wrote down? <laughs> Say, you remember all those policies that we wrote down? I said, yes. Uh, he said, we have to apply them. Ah, I said, no problem. I understand, sir. I understand, sir. Yeah. And it meant that it will be bound by certain things. What he was saying is that, you know I love you, but we have to follow policy. Yeah, we have to follow policy. So uh, uh, the, the, there's a policy that says... Um, you get uh, your, your salary will be sustained for six months. Yeah, that's the best. That's, that's for you and your family. And then you get a, a certain amount of money, maybe like 1.5 million or, one, or something like that. Pastor Deepa, you can remember now, I showed you guys everything. Yeah, because as they gave me the letter, I showed my immediate associate that was starting the church. This is what we have. And then we all need to go and look for more. Uh, what, what we got could barely buy the equipment we started with. We had to raise money for the venue ourselves. We had to do other things. And it's my six-month salary, I had to get it every month. So it's not like I got it once. <laughs> I'm just trying to be practical. So that if you're, if you're starting out and it looks like you don't have enough, please don't think like God is punishing you. That is the time for you to actually build your faith for what is ahead. And if there's anyone here, you have been on this journey for a while, and it still looks like the, 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 the provision is not coming as it ought to come, please also understand there are ways to prime the pump so that the provision can start to flow. But where you start from is that God wants to be sure that your heart is in the right place. Yeah. Because the heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. God will rather... Somebody stays in one place as in maintaining than for money to come, boom, and then mammon, shh. Of what profit is it to God or to his kingdom or to you if money will sweep, away, sweep you away? We all need to pass our money test. I've, I've, I've seen all, all sorts. I was in my office one day. I told you the story before. When a guy came, I think it was when we were trying to move from let me load it to uh, where we are now. The guy, after his uh, Sunday service in my office, if we were already going, he came in, and he came with $50,000 cash and just put it on the table and say, PG, I just feel led that I should, uh, uh, you know, sow this money, that, that, that he was just talking. 
in my mind, I was like, I can keep quiet and, and not ask any question whether you want to show it to me or to the church and just be, believe that it's me. Because you brought it, I said, God said you should show it and say I should pray for you. But I said, if you allow this guy to go and you did not ask him and you appropriate it to yourself, this may be your hand in ministry. So as I finished praying, I asked him, young man, so is this uh, money for the project or for the man of God? <laughs> oh, he said, oh, it's for the church, for the new project. Ah, God bless you. God bless you. Because you saved my life. You saved my life because, uh, you know, I've never seen dollars like this before. <laughs> and immediately, I called uh, the admin, our admin pastor, TJ. Quickly, quickly, TJ. Uh, somebody just brought this envelope. It's $50,000 inside it. Uh, today is Sunday. So you will have to take it home or something because I can't even risk it for you to leave it here. This place is not insured. This money, we need it. God needs it. We have to secure it. Maybe, we, you know, anyhow we are going to do. But the fact that I announced to him also immediately helped me. I told Pastor Yemi another story, which I'm going to tell. When we were buying our current location, the land uh, was for over a billion naira. I've shared the testimony before. The day we went to sign the document for the land with the sellers, we were to pay them about half of that money, like 550 million naira, wired into their account. I went with the trustees of the church. As I sat down there, and they were signing, the devil started to speak to me that your head is not correct. How can your church have 550 million naira? How much, and then how much do you have? I quickly, I, even, I think I even check online to see how much is my two accounts. Everything added up to about 500,000. And the devil was telling me, you are going to be poor for the rest of your life, the way you are going. You are serving God, serving God, serving God. And, <laughs> yeah. and I, was, I, was, I was there. They didn't know what was going on inside me, all the people in that room. About 10 or 15 people in that room, the big room, tolerance group, their head office, their directors were there, the trustees of our church, and me, I was sitting in one corner. The trustees were about to sign. And I was fighting the devil inside me. Because the devil wanted to sink my mood that day. And I would tell myself, from now, I cannot remain like this. Yeah. We will have to, I mean, the man of God is also, like, uh, a part of God. You understand? That kind of thing. But that day, I spoke to the devil. God's money is different from my money. The God who is blessing our church will bless me too. And will show me how to be blessed. Yeah, how to be blessed personally. And can I tell you the truth? From that time till now, that was the poorest I ever had in my life. Ah, things shifted. Yeah, things changed. In my personal finance, I'm saying, yeah. Many things shifted. Because you have to pass your own personal test. Yes, yes, yes. You have to. Let, let, me, let me say quickly three things. Three things that can make a pastor poor, even if God is blessing your church. Yeah. One, laziness. Laziness. Laziness can make a pastor poor, even if God wants to bless your church or God is blessing your church. In fact, a lazy pastor cannot pass away a large church. Let's just put that one on one side. Yeah. But it's possible for a, for a church to be blessed and for the pastor not to be blessed as much as he should if the pastor is lazy, one. Two, extravagance and excesses can make a pastor poor and can even affect the finances of the church. When you are nervously extravagant, extravagant and you love to do, you, you are very excessive as a person. And you are not coping it now that you are a man of God. Not many things are compatible with ministry. In the Old Testament, for God to use people like uh, Samson, God will, 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 will demand certain things. Cut certain excesses. Don't cut the hair. 
Don't drink this. Don't do that. You, you understand what I'm saying? There are things that God demands of us. So as a man of God, what is it that God has demanded of you that you know you have tendency for? That can affect the finances of the church, yet you are unwilling to let go. I don't know if you are getting what I'm saying. There will be things like that that God will demand of us just to prepare us for what is ahead of us. When we look at people ahead of us, you know, some people will look at someone like Pastor Deboe and you see that he will wear Adire and wear this. You think that he doesn't know where they said his Anna suit. Do you get what I'm saying? Somebody that was a university professor that used to wear suit and all that before he came into ministry. He now came into ministry, he started dressing down and all. I'm not saying everybody has to be like Pastor Deboe. But God must have spoken to him about something. That's all I'm saying. God must have demanded something from him. What is God demanding of you? Yeah. Especially about your proclivities and your tendencies. We are different. I mean, some people love to be somehow, you know, dress somehow, live in certain places, drive certain cars, you know, do all kinds of things. All those things are not the things I'm talking about. Excessiveness in them is part of what I'm talking about. Yes, it's part of it. But I'm saying that God knows who you are. He knows your temperament. Yeah, he does. He knows what you like and there are certain things he would demand of you because he wants to bless your work. And you have to be willing to let go. Are you still with me today? So I'm talking about laziness, extravagance, and excesses. Poor financial management. Yeah, poor financial management. When you cannot keep good record, all right? It's a bad thing. It can limit. You know, we say order makes for increase. Order there talks about being able to be accountable and putting the right things in place, you know, having proper budgets, plan ahead, bring report of last month's finances, how much came in, even if it's 20,000 naira, it is still money. Yeah, you cannot say when we become big, we will start to keep all the record. He that is faithful in little, more is added. The money may not be able to do anything, it may not even be enough for you to buy a recharge card or to, to charge your phone. Still keep the record. Yeah, still keep the record. I have, I have a prodigy who started a church a few years ago. When they started their church, he just wanted to be open, though. He would send me a report, and I would be laughing all by myself because the report does not look like a church. <laughs> I'm telling you. As in, what, what I mean that the report doesn't look like a church is that when you see all the uh, money that he's sending and keeping record, it's like 1,200. Is that somebody selling by roadside? Do you get what I'm saying? But ah, when, anytime I, I saw him, I will, I will encourage him because I was asking myself, if I was this guy, I wouldn't send any report. This, this thing is shameful. As in, it, doesn't, it doesn't look like you're doing anything serious. But he was doing like he was doing something serious. And he was very accountable. And it touched my heart because I was asking myself, God, man, if you are like this guy, will you do all these things? And I said, so, maybe he's even better than me. It's just a privilege that I'm mentoring him to know more things. But in, in, in being serious about little things and recognizing the importance of little things, this guy challenged me. And I loved him for it. Yeah. Because some people think until something is big, that's when it requires management. Yeah. You can imagine if you say, until your child becomes an adult, that's when you, you will be more focused on whether they hate or not, whether they had their bath or not, the kind of clothes they wore, as in taking care of them. Because they are small now, let them just be rolling all over the place, just do whatever they like. They will never live long to become an adult. That's why many businesses, many ministries die before, you know, the time. Thirdly, I've spoken about poor financial management. Thirdly, is uh, inability to give. I don't know which other word to use for it. 
not giving. Yeah. <laughs> not giving. Every pastor must model giving. Yeah. We must model giving. We must give personally. And then organize our churches to be giving churches. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. Organize your churches to be giving. See, when I talk about somebody who was sending a report of 1,200, in that report, 10% seed, as in 10% tithe, they already, they already separated it. And so you, why it's funny was that you now see seed, 120 naira, you know, and all that. It's just like, ah, this is really nice, but it's really very comical. It's very, it's, that was how I used to feel. But I kind of forget the impact that it made on me. Put seed account. Differently. Notwithstanding how small it is, God wants your church to be a giving church and He wants the pastor to be a giving pastor. If your church is just starting or is still very young, the finances are small, and you have never supported anything outside of your church, you are not doing well. You're not doing well. Yeah. I, I don't care how small the money is. If every money that comes in, Everything is spent also in your church. You're not doing well. Yeah, you're not doing well. From the first year of the Elevation Church, the first mission that we supported, my friend Lee Confessional was going to Malawi from the UK. And when I felt like sending them money for the Malawi mission, I said, how can a UK church be going to Malawi and we'll still be sending them money? But I felt the Holy Spirit said I should. Yeah. And I sent it. Uh, I was talking to uh, Dr. Shola recently, for the day. And he remi- I, I now remember that when the church was starting, we were just friends. He was starting a church in London. We were in Lagos. This was about five or six years ago or so. Yeah. We sent money. We sent money. You don't say because it's a London church and they, they, they are collecting pounds or are collecting naira. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. So, this is what I'm saying. As a church, as a ministry, if you are not sewing up, sewing down, and sewing sideways, as in giving to other ministries, you are not doing well. Yeah, you are not doing well. It has to be a giving ministry. You have to sew up ministers and ministries that are ahead of you. That one is a seed of honor. When you sew down, it's to meet needs. Yeah, to meet specific needs. Churches, ministries, doing things. Uh, some, I mean, when I hear a church is just starting sometimes, I just suck my spirit. God, do we have a part in this? Is there something that our church should do to help this ministry? And if I hear something in my spirit, yes, we sow into it. New church. Yeah, it doesn't have to be somebody that uh, came from our church or came from my spiritual lineage. No, 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 no. That's how we, we, we continue to sow personally and then sow also as, as a church. It's very, very important. And then put all the, uh, I mean, looking from Jesus' model, we see that there's a need for you to put all the other structures in place in your finances. Like, um, you know, after you've done maybe a bit of government registration, if you have a staff, doing the pay, you know, and all that. Jesus paid pay now. It was only two of them, him and Peter. They were old enough to pay taxes, over 30. Jesus was about 31 at that time. And he said, go to the river, get the thing out, and pay for yourself and myself. That's Matthew 17 and verse 27. And he said, let us do this so that we don't offend anybody. But he was doing it to fill our righteousness because he knew that it was part of what the devil can use against the finances of their ministry. Yeah. So it's very important. As at that time, only two of them. Only two of them. We can almost assume that all the other guys were definitely too young. Secondly, they, they were working like volunteers. But two of them, they expected that at their age, they would be earning. So they paid taxes. Because they were over 30. And they paid. It shows that the ministry of Jesus was well organized to take care of all those things. Now, uh, when we look at the ministry of Jesus also, we see that things were properly organized. Jesus had Judas who took 
charge of the purse. That means they had a treasurer, an accountant. The things that were given to Jesus were separate for things that were used for ministry. Because when the woman with the alabaster box came and broke it on Jesus, and they were complaining we could use this for ministry, Jesus said, no, this is for me. It's not for ministry. This was broken for me, for my body. It's for me, not for ministry. So everything was separated. Even when people were trying to say, no, ah, eh, this one, we can do it for... Mm -mm. Let's separate ministry from the man of God. What goes to ministry is different from what goes to the man of God, you know, uh, 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 and, and all that. And uh, God will always send people to meet your personal needs without you harassing them. God is the one that touches the heart of people. There are people who have been a blessing to me that I've never seen before. Yeah, never, never. There was a strange man that used to send me money. I've never seen him before. I'm still praying that God should raise more strange people like that. Yeah. They'll just uh, call, his PA will just call my PA and say, uh, there's something waiting for a pastor. And then, is that they send it or uh, my PA will go to their office. Uh, I said they should get his number for me. They got it. I texted him. He responded. I said, oh, maybe we'll say, ah, sometimes, pastor, don't worry, you know, and all that. For almost three or four years now, I've never seen him before. So I'm just saying, and it's not, uh, it's not small money. It's good money. Yeah. Both from within and outside of your congregation, God can raise people for you. So don't put your congregation under unnecessary pressure. There was nobody in the congregation of Jesus that could give him a alabaster box. Somebody came and came to pour it. Because he needed it, said, will prepare me for my funeral. Yeah. So if he was looking for a labata box and say, you people in this church, you are not okay. Somebody has been preaching to you, preaching, 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 you don't even bring a labata box. You don't do anything. You don't know where they sell perfume, wood, you know, all these kind of good, good things. Yeah. And see what you are doing for that person on that side. Be careful. Be careful. Be careful. Be careful. God has his own plans about how he wants to bless you. Let me also quickly say this to pastors, by vocational pastors or people who are under pressure financially. There's a difference between Paul and Peter when it comes to how they made money. You remember the story of Peter in, uh, in, in John chapter 21. John 21, when you read from verse 3 to 4, the moment Jesus left, Peter said, I go a fishing. John 21, chapter three, uh, verse 3 and 4, I go a fishing. He went. Jesus came back about uh, chapter, uh, verse 15 and said, Peter, do you love me more than this? Invariably, what we're seeing there was that Peter was not supposed to do any other thing apart from focusing on ministry. He was the one that said in verse 3, I go fishing after Jesus left. Jesus came back, multiplied fish to them, their eyes were open, and then he confronted him. But in the case of Paul, Paul was boldly writing that I'm doing my tent work. Yeah. Though you are sending me money and all that, I'm doing my tent work, and my God shall provide all your needs and all that and all that. So they, they, they are both ministers, but two different concepts. What am I saying, men and women of God? Don't put yourself under unnecessary pressure of not doing any other thing apart from the church if God is not stopping you. Are you hearing me? Because we have a model in the scriptures. You can't have three children in school or two children in school, or five children in school, and, you know, you, you, the church is too young to support your family, and you have opportunity to do certain things, except God says, no, do it. Yeah, and make some money, and support yourself, and support uh, other people around you, and support your family. Not everybody will have that, just like not every disciple of Christ has the opportunity, you know, to do other things, but Paul had it, and he used it. Lastly, let's teach our members on financial stewardship. Yeah. I think that's where, um, can, you, can you roll the last bit of my slide where I give examples of the teaching series that I've done on, on financial stewardship? Can you do that quickly if you have that slide? Yeah. I just wanted to give it as an example. So if you have it, uh, I'd love to show it. When we teach people about finances, what happened? Yeah, teaching on financial stewardship. Can you go on? Go on. Let me just show 
quickly, quickly. If you can't, quickly. Okay. Uh, yeah. Go on. I, yeah. These are, these are different teaching series. Maximize your authority. Tight. The generosity ladder. Go on. Uh, Harvest triggers. Uh, the generosity mirror. Go on. The title of that series was Generous. HD Blessing. This was maybe 2013 or 2014. Exploring the Abrahamic Covenant. Yeah. Your seed and your vision. These are, go on. These are stewardship. Uh, 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 is this the last one? If you have any other one, you can put it there. So these are, these are uh, different, different series on finances. You know the problem most of the time? We make demands without watering the ground. Without, you can't demand that something will grow out of nothing. There has to be a seed in there. People need to understand that there are biblical principles that undergirds their prosperity. And we give them the art of a steward that they are stewarding money for God. It's not their money. If you have been teaching that very well, a lot of people that are church members are arguing now or they're not paying tight, they will pay their tight because they have been properly taught. And it's part of managing the finances of your church. As you are teaching on financial stewardship, you are giving proper account of what is going on. And you demonstrate the fact that you can be trusted. Everything is not shrouded in secrecy. Yeah, there are churches where the only two people that knows anything, that know anything about finance of the church is the pastor and his wife. Yeah. And if the pastor is a woman, the only the husband. I told a friend of ours once, he was telling me about the financial problem in their church. I just told him, I said, get three more people in your church who know about the finances of the church. Let, not, let, let it not be that all church members come to you to ask what is going on about the finances of the church. And that just solved the problem for them. Because that church was going through a lot and everybody was coming to him. Uh, Pastor, we heard this. Uh, what, is, what is happening? There should be two other people that they can ask the same question and they will give them an accurate answer. And people will feel at ease. So we teach on financial stewardship. We keep records and we communicate the record from time to time. We let people know what is going on and we give them the opportunity uh, to interact with the, the not, not that uh, the, the financial report of the church is given to every member of the church. That's not what I'm saying. But there are people that they can say, oh, this, uh, uh, the money that we contributed six months ago, uh, what was done with it? And they can say, oh, we used it for this and that and that. And I'm aware, you know, not that until they get to the pastor. And many people will not come and ask you, so they will make it up on their own mind. Let me say this lastly. The car that I'm driving right now, when I was given this car, the person that gave me uh, bought it abroad. Before the car came, one day I woke up and I asked my wife. I said, we have run this church transparently so that people don't think that we just use church money anyhow. When this car comes, if I don't do anything now, we're going to be in trouble. And we prayed, and I just made up my mind. I'm going to confront the church and tell them, and share the testimony before the car came. I'm not going to wait for them to see me drive a car before I explain where the car is coming from. If the car is an official car, it's okay to talk about it, yeah? But this one is not an official car. As at the time, it's a sin for it to be an official car because of how much, <laughs> how much it's sold for. So what I did was just to come to the front of the church and just say, uh, I have a testimony just like you all share testimonies. Me too, I have a testimony today. And my testimony is very simple. I was standing at that door a few weeks ago, and a couple walked up to me, and they asked me about my car. And I said, I, I sold it. I gave it out. And they said, so, Pastor, you don't have a car now? I said, yes. So I said, ah, so we've been seeing you drive Madame's car. Uh, so we're going to do something about that. And the woman tapped the husband. God told you since January. Why didn't you do it? This is already July. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So, Pastor, don't worry. We'll talk during the week, and then I will be able to know what you want. Yeah. And I said, uh, the car will soon arrive. In another two weeks, I just want to put you in notice. It's a very good car, you know, and all. And everybody clapped. After the service, people were bringing offering to me to say, Pastor, uh, for your car. Uh, me too, I tap into that grace and all that. 
And then when the car came, people were coming to look at it and celebrating with me. So I have freedom of mind to drive my car anywhere at any time. God bless you.